Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. My name is Clayton Chastain, your host for today's episode. Today we have with us Dr. Trey Kellner, a swine nutritionist at AMVC. So Dr. Kellner, would you mind telling us about these two studies? We can start with the first one where you did the study during the wean to estrus period. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Clayton. So yeah, so as uh, many uh, producers and nutritionists are quite aware, feed costs have really increased uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, so our gestation feed cost is up, you know, about 40% uh, since March of 2020. So re-looking at our sow protocols um, across all stages of that maternal production, uh, one thing that we noticed that we were, we were high in was our wean to estrus period. And a lot of our farms kind of had that old school thought that if we push feed or, or let pigs be on ad lib feed or full feed, that will increase sow performance or will increase total born in the next litter. So a lot of our farms were giving 12 pounds or, you know, about five kilograms or six kilograms of feed from, from wean to when they were bred. So that four to seven day window. So we wanted to see if we could reduce that feed usage and that feed cost and see if we could still maintain sow performance. So what we did is we took 257 wean sows. Uh, that was one week of breeds. We calipered them. So we assigned them a category of thin, ideal, or heavy and used that as our block criteria. And then randomly allotted them to two treatments where they were fed either six pounds per day or 2.7 kilograms or 12 pounds per day, or 5.4 kilograms. Basically, we fed that from when they were weaned to when they were first serviced. And what we found is we found that there was no difference uh, on feed allotment between weaned to first service or weaned to estrus. We saw no difference in farrowing rate, so we saw no difference in, in how those sows fell out. And then we saw no difference in their subsequent litter performance, including total born, born alive, pre-weaning mortality, or number weaned. So what we concluded is that six pounds or 2.7 kilograms of feed per day from that weaning period to when she's bred is, is plenty to meet her requirements and to maximize her performance. And for us, that saves about $3 US uh, every cycle. So every time she's in that wean to breed period, today it saves a little over $3. Um, so that would be about, you know, $7 per sow per year. And for our system, that's a savings of just a little over a million dollars. Uh, I did not do that research alone. So I would like to give credit to our summer intern who conducted that research, Macy Reeb, who's currently a master's student at Kansas State and has a bright future in front of her. Interesting. So also with that, did you see any differences in body condition score, especially with the sows that were fed less feed during that wean to estrus period? Yeah. So why we measured uh, body condition score, uh, we did not capture that within our, our MetaFarms data, which we use to, uh, to kind of use as our data database for this, this experiment. Um, but we can uh, draw the conclusion that since we saw no difference in farrowing rate, and no difference in sow performance, that that small, you know, four to seven day window of feed allotment did not have any impact on body condition throughout gestation uh, because they performed the same throughout gestation and then once they entered the farrowing house. I see. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and move on to the second study. So the second study, you looked at differences in, or the possibility of feed contamination, correct? Correct. Yeah. So completely different train of thought here. So uh, we've kind of been bombarded and kind of all pork producers have been bombarded um, about feed mitigants. And, and there is a risk that that has been proven that feed can be a format or formite of various diseases uh, that can be spread uh, through feed. But there really hasn't been any research to show what's the actual risk, especially of domestic diseases. So PERS, PD, Delta Corona, TG, et cetera. Um, in everyday commercial production, right? So our system alone, we deliver about 20,000 loads of feed per year. Uh, clearly, we don't have 20,000 uh, virus breaks, um, you know, on an annual basis, right? Um, for instance, you know, our system in 2021 only had two PD breaks, right? So um, what is the actual risk and in how much should pork producers um you know, invest to then protect that risk, right? It's kind of like insurance, right? If you're in a floodplain, you should probably have flood insurance, right? Um, so that was the whole point of this experiment was to try to determine what the actual risk was. So to at least have a starting point, because there really hadn't been any research in this area uh, been done outside of the model, right? Where you've taken 
uh, feed and contaminated it and then shown how it spreads through a model feed mill or, you know, through an example finisher, an example sow farm, or, you know, how long is the virus, um, you know, quote unquote, present within a test tube, right? This is where manufacturing commercial feed, is there genetic evidence that the virus was there or not? Right. So what we did is we had 14 feed mills in Iowa. So that's all the feed mills that we use in the state of Iowa. And we sampled one um, batch of feed uh, per week for 16 weeks at each of these 14 feed mills. Once again, to try to build up that replication. Um, and we did that during, during two periods of the year. We had 12 weeks or 12 samples during the winter from November to February. And then we took four samples in June. And what we are trying to do is trying to evaluate what's the risk in a quote unquote high virus pressure situation or time of year, and then what, what might be a lower risk. Um, and actually when we ran the experiment, um, June the summers when everyone was breaking with uh, PERS 144C and PD was on the increase too. So the two disease times uh, might've been more similar than what, what we were hoping for. Uh, but basically across all these uh, 224 samples, uh, they were collected at each individual mill. Uh, we then had an identification code, and they were then mailed to the diagnostics laboratory at Iowa State University. And then they were, once again, uh, sampled for mRNA abundance uh, for viruses, PDV, uh, PERS, Delta coronavirus, and TGE. And what we found of these 224 feed samples that were collected across these 14 feed mills in 16 uh, weeks, uh, none of them showed any uh, genetic evidence or mRNA abundance of those four viruses. Um, so we, we couldn't find uh, any genetic material within those feed samples that we collected. So what this means is it does not disprove that feed uh, can't be a risk of, of, you know, kind of these domestic diseases. Um, and, and the risk is extremely um, important regardless of how small when we talk about foreign animal diseases such as classical swine fever, African swine fever, even foot and mouth, right? So so uh, basically this was just to provide a, a data set to pork producers uh, to see what, what actual risk it should be and, and what investment should they place once again on that insurance policy of mitigating uh, feed as a, as a potential uh, vector uh, for viruses. So you know, in our situation, a $10 per ton solution or a mitigant, which is pretty low on the scale for us is, you know, $2 million per year within our system. So it's quite a big investment for producers to make if, if you want to have a feed mitigant as part of your feeding program um, in all your sow diets. And if you want to do all your finishing diets as well, then it even goes further. Um, so yeah, what we want to do is say, uh, hey, you know, what's the actual risk? Uh, we, we took a stab at it with 224 samples. Uh, we were unable to detect any PERS, PD, TG, or Delta Corona. And um, yeah, I think there needs to be some further exploration within the space to see uh, what, what level of contamination is actually within our feed within the U.S. swine industry. Uh, support producers can make educated decisions on where their investment in terms of their biosecurity uh, portfolio and expenditures are on an annual basis uh, to make sure that, yeah, we're being as um, safe and as effective as we can be for our, our swine herds within the states. Yeah, absolutely. Any way we can increase our biosecurity is definitely something we want to strive for. Well, is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish up? Yeah, so I would like to think on that second study uh, that was funded by Iowa Pork Producers Association. So we'd like to give a shout out for the funding for that experiment. Uh, those, those, that analysis and that sampling was was not cheap. Uh, so, so I'd like to thank them for covering the cost of that much needed research. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for coming on the show, and to everyone else listening, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast channel and visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com so you won't miss out on the latest episodes. See you next week. Hey everyone, we're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it and share with us, feel free to send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to take a look at your research. Yeah.